Hi everyone, welcome to the Brown Hershey Podcast. I'm your host, Essen, and on today's episode, we've got anthropologist Aisha Khan, author of the book, The Deepest Die, Obeya Jose, and Race in the Atlantic World. It's a very fascinating episode. We're going to take a deep dive into the religious practices of Jose and Obeya in the Caribbean and use that to have an even bigger conversation about the concept of identity and race. So if you don't know what Obey and Jose is, don't worry, let me just give you some quick notes. Enslaved Africans brought spiritual practices to the Caribbean, which came to be called Obeya, and Indian indentured laborers came to the Caribbean after slavery was abolished, and they brought with them the religious practices and traditions of Muharram and Ashura, which came to be called Jose, which comes from Hussein. Both practices adapted to new landscapes and were persecuted by the colonial administrations, and eventually evolved into their own thing. So that's the quick 101. Also, Brown History takes a lot of work and a lot of time and energy, and if you would like to help out, please do consider being a patron. Any contribution, no matter how small, goes a very long way. If you want to sign up to be a patron, just visit brownhistorypodcast.com. Can't wait for you guys to listen to this episode. Let's start. Let's get this going. Here we go. You're, uh, okay, so uh, my first question, how about we you know, start off with you introducing yourself and then we can go to how the book came about. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Asan. And I also want to again say thank you uh, deeply for the, this invitation. Um, uh, no, everybody likes to talk about their work and share it with the world uh, or parts of the world, uh, anybody who's out there. So I, I, again, thank you. My name is Aisha Khan and I am a professor of anthropology at New York University. Uh, and I've been here now, I think almost, uh, gosh, a couple of decades, a little, a little short of that. And uh, my work has always uh, really uh, been focusing on uh, aspects of social inequality and uh, uh, geographically situated in what we now call the Atlantic world, uh, which means the Caribbean region and the various kinds of connections, historical and social and cultural that the region has always had with the rest of the hemisphere, always meaning historically always had. Uh, and so uh, I love the Atlantic world. Uh, it's my favorite place to think about uh, and, um, and to try to understand better because it's so very complicated. And one of the things I try to teach in my courses with whether graduates or undergraduate students is that you know, we, we need to try to unlearn what we think we know about places and peoples and even times or situations that we find um, uh, so familiar, that we think we already know. Uh, and, uh, and what I like to try to do uh, in my classes and in my work is to unearth and, uh, and uh, present uh, uh, the kinds of information and interpretations that help us think, wow, this is a lot more complicated as well as fascinating than I ever thought. You know, the Caribbean uh, and the, the Atlantic world is not simply uh, about um, uh, uh, what we get through the media imagery of, of tourist destinations, et cetera, mm-hmm. or, or dictators or, you know, uh, various kinds of stock set piece images that we have that we think says the whole story. So that's a mission to correct that. <laughs> So how did the, your book, how did that come, uh, come about? Well, you know, um, uh, part of what we do in academia uh, and certainly in what we call the book disciplines, meaning the disciplines that uh, we, you know, who concentrate on writing books, uh, like a, a scientist in a laboratory does amazing work through various kinds of experimentation that's really not so much based on writing books, but in the humanities and social scientists, sciences, excuse me, this is kind of our jam. This is what we do. And so part of the, uh, the kind of this production process means that you're, we're always thinking about life uh, and the complications of life and existential kinds of questions and trying to make them grounded you know, at least that's what I'm interested in thinking about is the abstract uh, issues and questions that we might ask ourselves, but then look at how they're actually lived. And in anthropology, we're very interested in what we call lived experience, right? So you have concepts and uh, and, uh, uh, in theories and philosophies, everybody does, every human uh, group does but then they are put into practice uh, in, uh, through lived experience. And so as I'm thinking about um, uh, different aspects of 
what fascinates me, the same kind of question keeps coming up over and over again in various uh, 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 parts of my work, various uh, channels that I have traveled along. And that's really in, I, I, what, you know, thinking about the concept of identity, which of course for many of us uh, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of to greater or lesser degree outliers in, uh, in the societies in which we grew up. And, and that, you know, can mean all kinds of things. It can be immigrant, it can be, you know, uh, a stigmatized uh, uh, population, whatever. Um, the identity has always been a, a fascination. And one of the things that, uh, uh, that fascinates me is when I'm puzzled about something, when something seems a little bit not easy uh, to understand. Uh, I take those as challenges. And I really uh, was, have been thinking for many, many years about identity as both a foundation for equality, right? That's a, 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 a basis on which we try to seek equal, social equality and justice. But at yeah. the same time, identity is an instrument through which power hierarchies are reinforced. And so this fascinating uh, problem appeared as a, as a appears as a kind of contradiction. Yeah. But I was thinking to myself, well, maybe it's just an apparent contradiction. You know, maybe it's not really a contradiction at all. The simultaneous function of identity as both, again, reinforcing inequality, but yet being the tool through which we try to uh, um, uh, determine and establish equality. So, so you use the religious practices of Jose and Obeya to explore the concept of identity? Yes. And so what I then had to do, because that's all, that's pretty abstract, what I just said. That was yeah. the starting point, yeah. you know? And, you know, this is what gets me up in the morning. What can I say? You know, <laughs> well, it's very, very, very fascinating. <laughs> but, I, but I do believe that most people think along these lines, maybe not with the same kinds of language or reference points, but I do think we have to honor all the curiosities that people have about their lives, right? Mm -hmm. And about why is something the way it is. That's the, one of the most important things that I think that I try to teach and try to exercise in, in my own living is, you know, I remember once many years ago, there was a, a commercial on TV. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not going to say what it was for, even the product, but the tagline was, uh, I guess it's supposed to, you know, e evoke this sort of uh, jaded, you know, younger person or so I don't I'm not sure but the question the tagline rhetorical question was why ask why mm. and I remember thinking and I you know and maybe you recognize you know I'm not going to go to what what it was but some people will recognize that um commercial and um, um and I just thought even at that time so many years ago I thought well what what do you mean always ask why yeah. right because once we ask why we are doing two things. We're looking or, or starting the journey of thinking about an alternative reality, right? But also it asking why reinforces the idea that things aren't inevitable, right? And I think as my, in my life experience coming to the U.S. and, and growing up and, and as a certain kind of, you know, uh, identifiable, allegedly identifiable person, uh, uh, always, uh, uh, I think, undergirded my, my, my idea and then reinforced by anthropology studies for so many years, that things are, are not inevitable, that, that however the society or the community or the situation that you're in may present itself, it's not destined, right? Yeah. There are ways that we can make our worlds better, uh, different and, and better. And, and, and the first way to start is to ask why. So that's a kind of concrete addition, I hope, or explanation uh, to my more philosophical uh, stance. But then, you know, uh, as I mentioned in the book, in the introduction, you know, I had to find a, a concrete examples of where, how this works, because you can talk, I'm not a philosopher, although I like philosophy, but I'm <laughs> certainly not proposing as a philosopher because I'm mm -hmm. not uh, trained in that. But I thought th this is all great, but it's abstractions. I need concrete uh, uh, examples. And so because of my long-term engagement in Caribbean studies, I thought pretty quickly of Obia and Jose as examples of this 
kind of duality in the, and, and apparent contradictions in the way we try understand identity. And that's because, and we can go into a little more detail what Obia and Jose are, but they are characterized uh, in the Caribbean historically as, and, and today, as really representing two distinct racial and religious phenomena, right? So Obia is linked to African heritage and, um, uh, uh, and African uh, or Afro-Atlantic religious traditions. Mm -hmm. Very specifically, Jose is linked to uh, uh, in, uh, Islam, right? Yeah. And we'll go into how that is. Uh, and therefore, uh, usually because of its Caribbean history, India, but of course there's a Persianate uh, background to, to Jose as well. But at the same time, so you have these distinctions going on here that are implicitly uh, 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 mutually exclusive, right? Like with yeah. you've got, uh, there's African, there's Indian, there's uh, uh, Afro-Atlantic and African religious traditions, and then there's South Asian or Indian or Persianate religious traditions. And so they are, there's, there's an implication that they're kind of apples and oranges. But at the same time, at the very same time, scholars and practitioners and devotees and observers uh, also recognize, you know, this is all out there, you know, this is not my big, oh, exposure, uh, it's out there, recognize that both Obia and Jose are utterly heterogeneous and diverse in the, both their practitioners and many of their beliefs and practices, right? right. So I was fascinated by, well, and, and, and also I have to say in Caribbean studies, there's wonderful, excellent work on Obia, a ton of it. There's a ton of it. And, and then the book I treat it, I, I try to treat it fairly um, and, 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 and in a way that people can pursue Obia studies if they wish. Um, and then also in Jose, now there's a lot less work on Jose than Obi, and we can talk about that a little later, but, but the work is very good, right? And so I had this uh, um, uh, body of uh, work to work with, plus my own research, I might add, mm -hmm. my own you know, 30 years of working in the Caribbean on both these subjects, but they are uh, t tend to be uh, uh, treated as separate and distinct. So you'll have all your Obia, terrific studies of Obia. You'll have ter really terrific, interesting studies of Jose, but not together. And so what I wanted to say is let's not treat them as apples and oranges. Let me look at both of them together in one study so I can challenge this idea ultimately of these innate, essential inevitable differences, right? So that, you know, what is it that, you know, that in other words, the fact that the Obia absolutely, without a doubt, has African heritage. Absol yeah. Absolutely. Jose, absolutely, without a doubt, has uh, South Asian and Persian heritage, Islamic heritage. Absolutely. But then what is it about their, um, the way they live in the experience of people in the Atlantic world, in the Caribbean, that helps us understand identity, not as something that lies within us essentially and inevitably, but that gets created as a process, created out of certain contexts of practice and experience, right. if, if that makes sense. Before before we get too much into this, could you, for people who don't know, could you explain the history of Obea and Jose and what it, that is and how that, I guess, the, the journey of it into the Caribbeans and, and, and how it was perceived by colonial authorities? Oh, absolutely. Uh, th th this is a, a, a very, uh, you know, both inspiring and, uh, and depressing stories because <laughs> they involve Euro colonialism. Right. That's the depressing part, <laughs> actually. But um, uh, Obia really consists of ritual practices and knowledge traditions that have to do with healing and divination that involve supernatural powers. And Obia's history really begins as a broad array of ancient religious traditions that hail from West and Central Africa. You know, uh, that's absolutely right. And but what's interesting is that these uh, ancient uh, religious traditions that have to do with healing and divination from West and Central Africa 
uh, travel to the Caribbean with enslaved Africans, but also free Africans. We have to remember that there are many kinds of um, uh, uh, journeys that Africans took to the Americas, right? And we don't want to reduce anybody to one kind of journey or one kind of existential condition, right? right. But for, but, the, uh, but uh, many millions, uh, maybe uh, scholars think around 12 million uh, of those who made it, uh, across the, 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 the water, um, uh, brought all kinds of cultural and religious uh, and other sorts of ways of knowing, as it were, their world. You know, and that's why it's really important to remember. And, and this argument died on the vine, thankfully, I think several decades ago, but the idea that Africans came to the new world and then were, had, were sort of culturally naked, as some scholars put it, which is so not correct, mm -hmm. right? You know, yes, there was a, there was a concerted effort on the part of Euro colonial powers to squash uh, 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 African traditions and heritage and belief systems and practices as a means of social control, right? right. But that's never a hundred percent. You can never completely erase a people, right? right. Uh, uh, as 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 surgically and drastically as you might uh, as this as this as the power uh, attempted. So. Uh, nonetheless, so when when uh, Africans came to the Americas and to the Caribbean, we're talking in particular, they had a, 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 a kind of regeneration of these uh, healing and divination practices that were both uh, a result of um, this new environment uh, in, in the Caribbean, right? A new, a completely new environment, but also uh, very, very importantly, through the efforts on um, Euro colonizers to stigmatize and again, uh, uh, eradicate. So Obia is in a sense, born out of these, this ancient array of traditions through its criminalization, right? Wow. Through being uh, uh, gradually pushed underground and targeted in, uh, uh, in ways that criminalized it legally, not just morally. Yes, there were moral, uh, uh, you know, criticisms of, 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 of Obia, absolutely. But, and this is in the scholarship, uh, some very brilliant work, and I subscribe to this uh, as well and talk a lot about criminalization. And that's a big theme in the book of both Obia uh, in racial and religious terms, how Western countries and, and, and Euro-colonial uh, heritage countries worked so hard to criminalize Obia. So Obia is formulated out of this rich and spectacular old world, if we say heritage, right? Old world simply meaning, you know, um, uh, Africa, Asia, and Europe, right? right? Coming into the new world, but criminalized into uh, a, a certain set of practices uh, uh, as well that were, and we can talk a little bit about, you know, what made these uh, uh, yeah, practices so sure. important to people. But uh, Jose shares, and one of the uh, kind of common denominators that I wanted to, 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 to argue exists between Obia and Jose to get out of this inherent type uh, uh, racializing uh, uh, and, and religifying typeness, if, I, if that makes any sense, that we uh, that that are that supposedly people embody uh, to try to get away from that by saying, well, Jose also is a product of an ancient and rich tradition, uh, a younger uh, uh, because Islam is only uh, from seventh uh, excuse seventh century. Excuse me, that's pretty old, right? Yeah. Uh, but I'm the, but African religious traditions that I'm talking about vis-a-vis -vis Obia are in relation to Obia are older than that, right? Uh, but in any case, you know we've got Islam as a very um, uh, a rich and ancient heritage as well. And we've got uh, uh, different uh, schools of thought. I'm going to make this very quick because this whole conversation. Take your, take your time. Take your time. There's <laughs> okay. no limit here. But um, uh, so you have um, uh, schools of thought. And um, one of the uh, 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 divisions, uh, again, not, not uh, insurmountable, but distinctions are is Sunni and Shia. But then there's also Ahmadiyya and there's other, other kinds. But as we know, uh, Sunni and Shia become um, uh, 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 more uh, con uh, more uh, contrasted after the um, uh, 
the Caliphate Wars uh, in, uh, in what is now Karbala, the Battle of Karbala, particularly around 680 AD, which is now present day Iraq, uh, when um, the, we have the martyrdom of the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, uh, and that is Hassan and Hussein. Okay, so this uh, 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 mourning ritual, M-O-U-R-N, mourning <laughs> ritual, um, uh, 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 becomes uh, um, uh, um, part of the important heritage of Shia Islam, right? Yeah. But then, of course, you have migrations of, from the Persianate world into India, right? For lo- lo- you know, many, many, many centuries, uh, and um, uh, you have a, 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 a kind of uh, um, uh, mixing of uh, traditions, even in India. So, uh, so uh, mu- uh, what become what is called Muharram, right? This morning ritual takes on uh, it, it, it keeps its uh, its fundamentals uh, of mourning and uh, and honoring of uh, the martyrs, but it takes on. Uh, various other kinds of um, practices and um, beliefs uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Sunni Islam and uh, other kinds of practitioners, even in India. In other words, all I'm saying here is that nothing is hermetically sealed. Nothing human beings do if they're t- if they're talking in any way to each other about anything is hermetically sealed. So, fine, you've got the observance of Muharram in India, and then you have after the abolition of slavery in the Caribbean, in the British Caribbean, right? This is important because Caribbean had many Euro colonizers, right? But in the British Caribbean, there's an abolition of slavery in 1838, right? Right. Or it's really 1834, but let's not split hairs. (laughs) I'm not sure how how deeply uh, folks want to get into this. They can. They can on their own. But anyway, there was apprenticeship for four years, but that was a whole nother thing. It was, apprenticeship actually was reparations that Britain gave to its its slave owners, right? As as we know. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Were. Yeah. I mean, we, they didn't call it reparations, but it was a way to ease the transition away from forced free labor to uh, n- n- allegedly not forced, not free labor, right? Right. But in any case... Um, uh, so the British have an, uh, a problem here, a uh, uh, challenge. Gosh, you know, we've got our entire, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, part, a lot, a, a significant part of our, our economy uh, and our interaction with a, the global uh, economy based on sugar plantations, right? Which is what uh, the enslaved uh, Africans were working on at the point of um, emancipation. And so, uh, what? gosh, what are we going to do? Well, long story short, they said, oh, we're going to go that, to that other ginormous colony of ours and look for replacement labor. We can't enslave them anymore, <laughs> but uh, because we are the paragons of the world now, you know, now we're schooling the whole world on how to be moral and decent, civilized people, right? These, this is British rhetorical strategies. Uh, But we can get we do have other colonies where we can coerce in the kinder, gentler, not allegedly um, uh, uh, violent uh, ways that uh, enslavement consisted of. What does that mean? We go to India, our other giant colony, and we take surplus labor from India and we indenture them. And so indenture becomes a kind of symbolic contrast to slavery because yeah. it's not oh gosh it's not you're not legal channel you know you but many people will argue and as i argue in the book there's not a clean uh severing of the ideology or practice of slavery uh, uh, uh into indenture now i am not 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 saying they are the same thing and i say in the book many ways they are why they're not the same thing Right. Uh, but uh, there it, it isn't a clean break. And all of a sudden, this is now a, a worker's utopia. Right. Indenture. Uh, it involves contracts. Yes. And allegedly voluntary. But all of this is a very murky gray area, uh, as, as you w- could imagine, when you're surplus labor in a colony uh, uh, where the uh, colonizer is really not uh, uh, very respectful 
uh, of, uh, of certainly of, of, of Indians who are not, um, you know, of the peasantry and, and, and lower caste, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are uh, about 438-ish, give or take, Indians are shipped over in this very complicated and always very precarious which I write about in the book, which is something I learned, which is really interesting to me. It wasn't this well-oiled machine that we think of, right? It was, it, it worked, you know, it brought a, a, almost half a million Indians over to be indentured laborers on sugar plantations, but it was always a precarious uh, uh, kind of um, uh, insecure operation, right? So the indentured Indians come over, but of course, like Africans in the new world, Indians bring their customs and traditions and values and philosophies with them. And they bring Muharram with them as they've been uh, uh, observing uh, over there in India, but they call it Jose. It becomes called Jose, H-O-S-A-Y, after, as you probably guessed, Hossein. Right. The, the, uh, one of the the, the principal uh, uh, in the martyr. battle uh, martyr, yes, and it, so that's uh, so it's not J O S E the Spanish name, it's H O S A Y, which is uh, which is the written pronunciation of Hussein, and sometimes it's called Hussein, by the way, in the Caribbean. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's called Hossein, but most or uh, mostly it's Jose, right? And so these uh, um, uh, traditions are. Uh, in their own way, very, very threatening to the colonizers. And, uh, and uh, they are ways that people both operate under the radar, right, uh, with uh, uh, exchanging beliefs and practices uh, and their values, mm -hmm. uh, which is always is a challenge to authority, right? When there's stuff going on that's under the radar that you didn't uh, uh, dictate, and it also provides opportunities for, you know, sharing uh, of consciousness, you know, sharing of uh, alternative ways, again, of thinking of the world, the whys, right? It, you know, congeals the whys into actual physical groups of people, or in the case of Obia, it wouldn't be public groups of people. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's private um, uh, kinds of acts of divination and healing, but still, it is a, uh, a, a keeping alive traditions that are antithetical to uh, Euro colonialism, or at least viewed that way, right? And so, Ho Jose, I argue in the book as a common denominator with Obia, is also born out of its criminalization in the Caribbean. Again, I am not saying that it, that's the case for uh, Obia or Jose in their originary homes. No, in Africa and India, respectively, uh, West and Central Africa and India, respectively, no. But in the Caribbean, given that they're operating under conditions of extreme duress, coerced labor, whether it's enslavement or indenture, and a colonizer, you know, hell-bent on, uh, on control, and control in the most dire necessity of labor, Right. They're not just trying to control, you know, what kind of shoes people buy. Right. They're trying to control actual production and profits, which is a, a very, uh, you know, imperative uh, kind of, uh, you know, agenda if you're a colonizer. Right. So criminalization works to uh, bring about uh, these two um, uh, new, in a sense, you could you could argue they are indigenous in, to the Caribbean in their new in their rebirth. They were never able to fully end these religious practices, did they? Never, 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 never. Not no. even, not even close. Like there weren't any. Uh, uh, not, they made it very, very hard for yeah. people. They made it perhaps more uh, reduced in terms of the kinds of activities that could occur and practices, especially if you're, you know, uh, in, in terms of Obia, you have to be underground because it's completely Ill, uh, criminalized and, Ill, and illegal. And yeah. in terms of Jose, you know, again, because it's super, super interesting, you know, by then the British cannot look draconian. They have to look like the saints that they are claiming they are to be in the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have to, and also remember, you know, I, again, there's so many branches to this. It's so fascinating. 
there's the, you know, 1857 Sepoy Rebellion, and that scares the heck out of, you know, Victorians, uh, Victorian English, right? right? And so they have to act, uh, and, and Victoria, uh, and I write about this in the book, I quote the proclamation, Victoria's very famous proclamation, where she's basically, it was, it's after the Sepoy Rebellion, and I don't say mutiny, because I like to really emphasize that it was a, it was the oppressed rebellion, it wasn't a mutiny, uh, I mean, in the sense of bad for the colonizers, it was, right, you know, right, but uh, in any case, Victoria basically writes, yeah, we're, you know, we, we're, this is a, you know, a brand new day, and we are going to honor, you know, we honor all of your religions, and as inferior and terrible as they are, because they're not Christianity, you know, uh, we're going to honor them, and so there's a, 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 a curtailment of Jose in a way that it is not made illegal. It's not pushed underground as, as superstition, as magic, as dangerous forms of, um, uh, of resistance. But it is all, it's still it's understood as resisting as resistance if allowed to be expressed as openly and widely as practitioners would like to. And so what uh, the British colonizers do is say, you know, over time, if quickly, you can only march, uh, and we, I can describe what Jose consists of, but you can only march uh, between uh, uh, plantations. You cannot go on the main roads. You cannot, you, you know, you, you cannot uh, take time off from work uh, to observe it except for one day or two days or whatever was decided. So there were extreme limitations imposed on, on the uh, observance of Jose. And there were even more extreme limitations opposed, Im imposed, excuse me, on Obia. Uh, uh, so it does affect them. The criminalization in, 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 in respectively for both of them does affect their, um, uh, uh, you know, again, their kind of rise and, and, and evolution, uh, if, you, if you will, in the region. But they're, to answer your question, no, they are never um, uh, uh, um, completely silenced or erased. From my understanding, Obea is, is a very, I guess, more of a private, uh, you can do it in your room, in your house, in the privacy of your own home. And Jose is a very public march. It's loud. You can't really put it under the carpet. Why, you know, so if you're going to practice it, it's you're putting yourself out there. So why do you think that people back then risked and jeopardized their, their lives, their, their jobs to practice these uh, religious traditions? Absolutely. The whole point of Obia is to uh, uh, operate uh, uh, in, as a private uh, uh, re relationship or engagement between the, 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 uh, the leader, the, the clergy representative of, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the devotee. Right. So that that's absolutely uh, correct. And I talk about that at length in the book. And, and that is a real contrast. I'm never saying in the book, by the way, I'm never saying that Obi and Jose are the same thing ever, mm -hmm. ever, ever, because uh, they're not. Uh, I, I'm what and I make it very clear that they're not. But what I'm looking for are these common denominators to help us understand how they become it. They become kinds of identities and out of what similar circumstances of colonialism and criminalization and coercion and resistance uh, play into their uh, uh, evolution in this part of the world. But so yes, Obia is a private uh, engagement uh, with a smaller number of people. Obviously, Jose, the whole point of Jose is to be out there to be public, to announce you know, the martyrdom and the mourning, uh, and also uh, uh, um, uh, to honor uh, one's um, uh, heritage. Uh, and again, you know, uh, the, the more you limit that, if you're the colonizer, the more you think that you are, 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 are you know, containment, you know, you would like containment to result in, um, in, in, in demise. You would like you know, criminalization in the sense of being illegal to result in demise, but it doesn't. But why it is they have these these uh, traditions have such a life to them, vibrant mm -hmm. uh, it's a, even today, is really I think consistent over time. Very basic reasons that are consistent over time, and that is that one, I just think very very plain and simple, people are people insist on their own self expression. Right in the face of you know colonial and present day forms of denial, right? I mean, they're still in the Caribbean. Obia is there are very few countries where Obia is uh, is legalized, 
right? Even if it's not practiced in terms of you know, going after people criminally, it's on the books as uh, 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 illegal, right? And right. Jose, not 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 uh, not the case, but there's a lot all kinds of criticisms about how it is undertaken and how you know public it, it, and how much of a public nuisance versus a public uh, regeneration of spirit it is so i think the, to answer your question the the one of the main reasons for the the life you know the the the, the, the most most exuberant insistent life of these traditions is one people insist on uh, self expression in the face of oppression and that this would be in this case colonial but also post colonial as well right up to today you know, you you can't kill the human spirit. I really do believe that, uh, and uh, and you can make people suffer horribly. I'm this is not whitewashing, you know, or trivializing yeah. on my part at all. But you cannot kill the human spirit. But also, I think that Jose and Obia share that. So that's one reason I think the insistent self expressiveness that people uh, um, uh, continue uh, over time. Uh, uh, you know, as long as they're alive. And uh, I think also that another reason that Obia and Jose share in, in, t- in terms of your question about this, you know, why they're, they're, you know, why they're so palpable today is that, you know, people need to understand their current circumstances and, and, to, uh, un, uh, and to seek a better future, right? Everybody, ha- every human being has to do that. Every human being from time immemorial has sought to understand the circumstances in which they live. I don't care, you know, what, what you know, t- five million years ago in human history or today, and also to try to seek a better future. There's no, there's no human being or society that is not thought in some way of how to do that. And so I think in situations where there is dire oppression and where the entire society is deliberately structured to impose inequality, particularly through creating types, allegedly types of people who are supposedly inferior or superior to each other. And when a a whole society is based on this kind of hierarchizing of inferior to superior people and, and, and the types that these people supposedly embody, and represent, I think then this uh, uh, urge to understand one's circumstances and seek a better future comes out as uh, resistance, right? Again, it's a kind of another example, I think of the insistence of the spirit, of human spirit. I'm gonna get choked up now. (laughs) (laughs) Insistence of the human spirit. And it comes out in under conditions of uh, uh, these kinds of um, deliberately structured uh, social uh, inequality, and it comes out as a, a kind of uh, uh, resistance. We will live, and we will live to understand our, our existence better and to make for a better future. And this may be conscious, and it may be uh, not, uh, you know, out of awareness. I'm not saying every waking moment of everybody's life for the last 500 years in the Americas has been one big social movement. No. Yeah. You know, social movements are a culmination uh-huh. and a congealing and a vocalizing in certain kinds of language, shared language, right? Of uh, of, of these or, uh, of these, I think, very human uh, substances and 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 and, and proclivities, if you will, urges. You know, that urges of spirit. And but I do want to make it clear that I think that this kind of uh, insistent resistance. It isn't always the case if the societies, I'm thinking of ancient ones, like in anthropology, we talk about gatherer hunter societies that were far more egalitarian, right? In all kinds of ways, right? Egalitarian in terms of division of labor, in terms of gender roles, et cetera. It, I do still believe that the, these societies, peoples have an urge for self-expressiveness and uh, to understand their, their circumstances and make for better futures. But I think, that the real uh, key uh, of, of, of these uh, uh, manifesting as forms of resistance and being interpreted as troublesome forms of resistance on the part of the oppressors comes out um, in uh, colonial and post-colonial um, uh, conditions, uh, particularly that we see in the Americas. I mean, the entire Americas uh, pretty much uh, is, uh, I would say, 
virtually all, pretty much, you can't ever say 100%, but, you know, almost all uh, uh, are, are uh, is a, uh, the histories are products of various kinds of colonial domination. We were, and, we were ta- and it's resistance. We were talking about identity at the beginning and how expressing your identity is a way of, is a way, it could be a way of reaching equality, but it can also be used as an oppressive tactic to 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 keep social hierarchies as the way they are how yeah. so so when these guys are performing uh jose and obeya they're kind of it's like a political fight a political protest to kind of try to find a better life for themselves in a sense oh either deli- consciously or, or just Un- unconsciously yeah yeah so then how does uh how does it work from the oppressor's kind of view from the uh pers- oppressor angle if they are pushing them back to to stop doing this stuff isn't that kind of taking away their identity or are they giving them another identity or or in or i guess from their view their identity is to just is below them and is to not is to not uh, be disobedient well that's that's a great co- great concretizing question thank you so much Austin. the, the what what um, the, from the from the, uh, the the top down point of view, the colonizer point of view, yeah. is that number one, the identities of their various constituencies are really embodied types, and that's what I talk about in the book. And what I mean by that is embodied racial and religious types of person, right? And that and they are. Uh, and again, I talk in the book about. They, how race, uh, racial and religious uh, uh, types of person, alleged types of persons are intersectional, right? So a reli- uh, in, within the, the, the colonial viewpoint, the Euro colonial viewpoint, a, 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 um, uh, a you know, a, a, let's say a, a Hindu so-called, uh, forgive the expression, this is what they were called, so-called coolie laborer, and there is, by the way, parenthetically, a movement to 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 recapture the 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 uh, the, the, the phrase uh, the the term coolie, as many good works, uh, you know, Gouger, uh, uh, coolie woman, and all, you know, the title of her great book. So you know, but it's still a derogatory term. So I want to flag that. But that was the term. So the idea that you were a, 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 a coolie laborer, quote unquote, forgive me. Um, uh, that's Hindu uh, in uh, to British colonizers also it, uh, embodies a certain kind of racial type, right? Um, and, and and I would say in the British colonial view, it was a kind. And what I argue in the book is it's a kind of blackness, and it fits under the umbrella of your brown history, absolutely, right? Because what I try to argue in the book is that blackness is yes, it can refer to African heritage people. But and it is claimed by African heritage people as a point of pride and strength and dignity, right? But blackness can also be, uh, from a Euro colonial point of view, a much more uh, broad sweeping uh, uh, derogatory rubric that identifies, allegedly identifies a certain type of human being. And so we, you, you've got, you know, Euro colonial saying, okay, you've, we've got these identities, uh, but they're not interested in, you know, the philosophies and, 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 you know, and existential quandaries of, of these yeah. colonized people, right? They, what they are seeing is a racialized, religionized, as I put it, and, and, and again, they're intersectional as shout out to Kimberly Crenshaw's notion of intersectionality, which I use in the book. Um, and so they kind of are crossing over and defining each other. So racial types also indicates a religious type and religious type also indicates a racial type, right? So they, so they, they embody the same kind of person. And so the identities of, um, uh, on the part of, 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 of uh, laborers, because remember Euro colonials are looking at these folks and let's just leave it at British colonials, they're looking at these folks primarily in terms of labor. They don't care too much about them. They want them tractable and profitable. That's it. Profitable for them, not for the laborers, right? And so they are reduced. Their identities become reduced to certain kinds of racialized, religionized types, as I said. And these types, by and large, represent vastly inferior stages, allegedly, stages of human development, 
right, of human cultural evolution. So they're still, Euro, you know, British colonizers, Euro colonizers are still operating on this old, you know, enlightenment and post-enlightenment ranking of humans that were developing. You've got your savages, you've got your barbarians, you've got, and then you've got your civilized at the top. Right. right. And of course, the British saw themselves as at the apex even of, of civilization, even over their, 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 their European neighbors. Right. So the, 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 uh, um, the identities that colonial, the colonial gaze imposed on their colonized people, again, primarily through the optic, through the lens of labor, it becomes you are more or less a savage. You are more or less a barbarian, right? And that is measured in terms of your racial and religious status as the colonizer defines it, right? Not the, not the, not the, 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 the uh, African and South Asian or African and Indian people. Nobody's asking them what they think, right? I'm not saying they believe this. No, of course not. They weren't crazy and self-hating, no. But this is, you, you asked me about the colonial point of view. And so the, the uh, identity uh, of these folks, as I just sort of summarized, would, would be through that colonial gaze. And they could never really reach that apex, that, that, that highest point of civilized person. They could get close. So you want to drain or erase, silence, criminalize all of these, let's just call them for brevity's sake, bad habits. Uh, on, uh, that keep these racialized people racialized in the bad way, right? Keep these religionized people religionized in the bad way. And we can maybe get them, uh, if they become Christians, if they become uh, um, middle, if, they, if we allow them in some way to get access to mid, the middle class, which did happen, you know, absolutely yeah. it happened on the Atlantic world. There's lots of middle class populations who are not European heritage, right? Many, you know, it's, you know, a lot, high, very high percentage, but that was a process, right? It takes a while. But even at that point, there is a kind of, uh, if I may borrow the term from another kind of discrimination, a kind of glass ceiling, if you will. And so the identities uh, of, the, of, the, of the colonized through the, the gaze of the colonizer were really reduced to how, how much and how um, unappealingly are you expressing your racial and religious selves that are really uh, um, uh, uh, marking you as a certain kind of inferior laborer. That's, that's really fascinating. That's a lot of process. I hope um, that was clear. Yeah, it was clear, yeah. You see, it's a complicated story, man. It is and very complicated. Yeah, but it's so fascinating. It is. You were talking about how, about intersectionality between the two groups. What, what is the intersectionality between the two groups? I, I could understand uh, people of African descent going to Obeya festivals and... and well, no, and, no, you know, Obeya doesn't have festivals. Sorry, not festivals, processions. No, uh, you mean Jose? Jose, yeah. Yeah, Obey doesn't have processions. No, 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 no. People, people from Obeya side coming into uh -huh. right. the uh, marches of Jose right. and right. joining in and observing. Right. But Obeya is very, I guess, private and low key. Did people from Indian descent come over and and kind of participate into the Obeya traditions? Oh, that's. Fab. Every question you ask is so exciting because the material, A, you've got great questions. B, the material is really exciting. And thank you, by the way, for educating yourself, you know, with, uh, so we can have this rich conversation. I appreciate that your questions are really awesome. So to, to answer you, um, uh, as I said uh, uh, at the outset of, the, of our conversation, you know, uh, Obi and Jose are treated on the one hand as strictly African, strictly Indian, but at the same time acknowledged as having heterogeneous participants and uh, also ideas and practices, value, you know, beliefs, et cetera. So there's that kind of interesting puzzle. Well, yes, for one thing, Jose, when it started in India, it was right. already a diverse uh, uh, phenomenon, as I said. So, and when it comes to the Caribbean, who do you think 
is the greatest percentage of people who participate in Jose, who keep it alive, who, who keep, uh, you know, who march the, the Tajas, or the, the, which are the tombs, of gorgeous, immense, spectacularly beautiful uh, replicas of the tombs of the martyrs, right, uh, Hassan and Hussein. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and undertake the rituals, uh, the purifying and other rituals. Who do you think uh, uh, mostly uh, is, is, is doing this? I'm going to say, I'm going to say Indian descent, people of Indian descent, but I'm going to assume that it's, it's people of African descent. No, no, you're right that it's uh, from, uh, primarily people of Indian descent, but Hindus. Hindus. Is, and, and again, that's partly a demographic, uh, you know. Uh, so so uh, it's, is majority Hindus that are practicing Jose yes. in the yeah, Caribbean. Yeah, and I remember that, yes, and that, yes, but remember, that's wild. That's because more, more Hindus came over as indentured laborers than Muslims. The yeah, but it's a Muslim, uh, it's a Muslim yeah, yeah, practice. Yeah. So there are Muslims. Do not misunderstand. I hope nobody misunderstands. Of course, Muslims uh, participate in Jose, of course, but they have stronger debates about the appropriateness of this morning ritual, right? I mean, is this, how Islamic is it, right? And they're, uh, um, uh, they're just a smaller percentage of the population of Indian heritage people, right? right. But so also you've always had uh, African heritage people participating in Jose. First of all, they worked uh, uh, with folks either on or near the, the uh, sugar plantations. Now they're no longer enslaved, but they may be, uh, uh, growing peasant farmers, or they may have worked, or they may live close by. So there's that overlap, right? And uh, always, and there's also um, uh, uh, participation, not in the in the in the in the in the strict, uh, very observant Muslim rituals that are involved with Jose. No, they they would not do that. Uh, but because uh, they're mostly Christians, the the African heritage people who are participating, but they are uh, the drummers. And the builders of the Tajas, these gorgeous Tajas. I don't mean they are only the uh, uh, drummers and builders. Right. Uh, other, you know, <laughs> Indian, plenty of Indians are drumming uh, and building also. Wow. But they help with the actual cons design and construction of the Tajas and the, the, the drumming. Um, and it may be less the case today, visually, but it's not completely uh, not found today and certainly historically it was very uh, diverse and so um uh that that's a, an example of this intersectionality uh, uh, uh right there but we have to remember that uh, that you know what we call obia in the americas is a kind of and as scholars have pointed out a uh, very brilliant scholars of obia uh, it's a catch-all term as it's called right it's because obia there was no obia as such as we know it in the Caribbean in West and Central Africa. There are, there are ancient and enormous, complicated, ancient array of, 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 of uh, traditions of healing and divination that involve the supernatural that become congealed as a particular uh, 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 phenomenon called obia. But the idea of Divination and healing supernatural powers and the kinds of um, uh, 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 um, forces of benevolence and malevolence are universal. So in India, you know, you might you wouldn't have called it obia, and you wouldn't have said it's exactly a, a, a parallel, a, a analogous to what's going on in West and Central Africa. But every every part of the world has a body of belief that deals in these kinds of missions of healing divination through interaction with supernatural powers and struggles between benevolent and malevolence. Right. right. And in Christianity, they call it good and evil, but you know, not everybody calls it good and evil, but there, that's benevolence and malevolence is something that's pr uh, pervasive. And so, uh, you know, when you have folks uh, in the Caribbean, of course, uh, people, all kinds of people consult obia men and obia women as they're called right and in my book i talk about that and also obia men and women they're largely african heritage people but they can be indian heritage depending on what their skill set is and what their occupational interests are at right and their, right, and right. their knowledge um and so uh there's um a a, a kind of 
ability or, 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 or inevitability, let me say, inevitability of sharing and crossover, even if, for example, in Obia, it's supposed to be a private kind of interaction because you've still got the popular wisdom, right? What I call in my book, and I talk about it a lot, what I call the common sense uh, uh, um, uh, uh, awareness uh, uh, that that is pervasive everywhere. Everybody's got common sense, and I don't mean co- I, I explain what I mean by common sense. I don't mean it like what we, the colloquial. Uh, oh, that just use your common sense like a good thing. I mean common sense and Antonio Gramsci's uh, sense, uh, but which I won't rehearse here because that might put people might not be into that. But uh, it's a, a larger idea of what uh, is a kind of taken for granted. A uh, way of understanding something, right? Um, and it, which can be a, a positive or negative, or neither. You know, that's not the part that the issue. So you've got these common sense understandings of how to operate in the world floating around, which are not contained by private uh, um, uh, implementation, right? Private put, like putting them into practice. And you know what? As you were asking me the question, I was thinking an ana- about an analogy, and I hope this isn't too crazy sounding. It, it reminded me of, uh, like a of therapy, you know, uh, a psychological counseling and therapy. And I'm not saying Ovia is that. I'm not saying Jose is that, but I'm making an analogy here where, you know, you've got therapy is a very private interaction between the, the therapist, the specialist, and the patient, right? The devotee, however you want to call it. But still, we know all about therapy socially because it's a thing, right? Yeah. It's, so it's a, it's it's in our common sense wisdom of what you know are, are part of our social interaction habits, even though we are not privy to what goes on in these interchanges individually. So so you have you have these two religious practices, Jose and Obeya. Since their arrival, they've been through a lot. They've been through political oppression. Uh, different landscape new landscapes and if i were to google jose if i were to google muharram in pakistan and i look at photos between jose in trinidad let's say and muharram in pakistan you could just see visually that there's a difference between the two what has changed for obeya and jose since its arrival and what is the current what is the current state of their uh, practices and movements in today's time? Well, uh, I'll start with the second question first, because it's sure. shorter. Um, uh, Obia is alive and well. It's alive and well, and all, you know, uh, everywhere, certainly uh, everywhere in the Atlantic world and arguably universally. Um, again, it is uh, only becomes a reduced thing through its criminalization in a particular historical and social context, right? Otherwise, it's just this enormous array. So, for example, in the in the U.S., you know, we talk about even such things related things as mojo. I got my mojo working, or uh, you know, um, uh, um, yeah, uh, other other kinds of expressions uh, that we get from uh, Amer- U.S. history, right, and particularly Southern history, uh, or even. Uh, what has have become uh, identified as Vodun, as Santeria, as Candomblé. All of these are Atlantic religious traditions that hail from origin points in the old world and that have aspects of what would be identified, you know, from the, the vantage point of the history of the Americas as obia, as containing obia. And that uh, as some celebrate that, I hope, I know, uh, as uh, keeping the spirit, uh, human spirit alive. Others decry it as superstition and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and danger, right? So these are always constantly debated uh, uh, processes and with very fluid sorts of associations, right? But uh, so obia is alive and well, I mean, and again, uh, in the book, I have uh, uh, the last uh, chapter on Obia, I have a really, uh, th- what I think is a super interesting court case that takes place in, you know, uh, uh, just a, a few years ago in uh, in Canada at the Ontario Court of Appeals, um, uh, and it is an Obia case. 
Uh, and it's very, very interesting as, you know, on the one hand, you know, you've got your Canadian uh, charters of rights and freedoms, which I know, you know, you know very well, right? right. Um, uh, uh, saying, you know, Obia is a religion. Oh, so that's not the issue, right? We got to honor Obia as, as, a, as a religion, a, a, equivalent to other world religions. And that's, uh, that's a good thing. And then there's all of these issues around the when Obia was put into practice in these two court cases that I write about. And I was in the courtroom and also I have all the court documents to, to, to talk to, to use to build on. When Obia is put into practice, it's not just theoretically uh, in principle, uh, a religion, uh, a legitimate religion as defined by the Canadian Charter, but it is and put into practice for reasons that are debatably against the conscience of the community, as the legalese term uh, says it, then it becomes uh, 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 a matter of where does Obia live, right? Where, you know, what, 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 uh, you know, what has happened to Obia, right? So I'm not saying it's so diffuse that it's just everywhere living in, in harmony and utopia. I'm saying that it's so diffuse that it appears in various manifestations. And again, those manifestations are defined by uh, various kinds of worldviews, right? You know, right. I, I can say I see X practice. Oh, I know that's Vodou. Well, maybe somebody else says, no, it's not, uh, it's not what Vodou is. It's something else, right? And I'm deliberately saying Vodou or Vodoun as a respect because voodoo is not uh, really uh, as, as, you know, it, it, we should honor these, all of these uh, traditions in properly, however we, way we do it. But, um, uh, and so, uh, you know, Obia is alive and well and is received, is practiced and received in these varying kinds of ways. And again, in that same chapter, I end with that, a long discussion of the, the two court cases, which is super fascinating, I think. But I also talk about uh, Obia's representation in uh, just a couple of years ago in the Netflix uh, series, Luke Cage. Luke Cage is the first black superhero. He's right. uh, um, um, uh, uh, created in the in 1970s, mid 1970s. And I talk about all that, but it's really interesting in, in, in its final season, Luke Cage, uh, the superhero comes up against the Bushmaster who traffics in Obia to get his superpowers, right? And so that's another kind of visualization or imaginary, um, uh, 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 imagined way of thinking about Obia, that, but it's alive and well. And before that, I talk about the Windrush generation in the same chapter. Uh, um, and uh, in 1948, there's a, a Windrush generation. And a few years later, one of its early um, uh, um, dramatic artists, uh, uh, a theater uh, and, uh, and, and fiction writer, uh, Barry Record was his name, uh, writes a play. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the play is, again, attentions around superstition and modernity and good and evil. And Obia doesn't come out looking very good. Right? <laughs> uh, and Barry Record is, you know, uh, 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 one of the part of the uh, uh, Jamaican part from the uh, the Windrush generation. But, you know, people are torn. That's what makes these the life, if you can put it uh, that way, of these traditions, uh, racialized religious traditions, religionized racial traditions. So fascinating because the life they live is uh, is fluid and um, uh, really, uh, um, you know, a matter of, of worldview and the authority to impose a particular worldview on it, right? Now, Jose has, you know, been, you know, no longer is practiced in uh, Guyana. It's a little bit uh, in Jamaica. Primarily, it's a heritage of Trinidad. It's really people struggle very hard every year to keep it uh, uh, going. And it depends a little bit as much as possible on government support, uh, you know, funding, and, uh, and international uh, participation, donations, but also um, there's really wonderful dialogues, international dialogues among the artists who um, uh, uh, design the Tajas or the giant tombs. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, this, and it's annual, as you, you know, the Islamic calendar uh, uh, in the month of Muharram is, is what it goes by. So it's annual, it's not the 
thousands and thousands of, uh, of people uh, involved uh, that it was in the past. And people today, local Trinidadians today will tell, say this, and they, some are lamenting it and some are you know, uh, not unhappy about it, but it has diminished. But as I said, I, I, I write about in the book, I don't, because Jose means so many other things transcending its ritual uh, aspect, which is, which is there. The, the ritual aspect is there. It's very real. But the meanings and significance for people are so transcendent, again, about self-expression, right, and insistent spirit that I see no reason why Jose won't keep on in one way or another uh, 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 anytime soon, let's at least. And Obia, because it's so diffuse, again, that that I, I, the trajectory will will take it where the winds of of, of spirit and spirits take it. Very cool. Uh, my last question is, you know, if someone wants to learn more about Jose and Obia and, and, and identity, I guess, is there any books or or scholars you recommend? Oh, of course, myself. Of course, that's a given. <laughs> and, and but what what I would but for the short answer because there's a lot. But the short answer is if people are interested. Because the last chapter of the book, I kind of, I, I do reference Obia and Jose. Of course, I bring the, the, the last chapter is, is by way of conclusion. And it, it, of course, I, I, I refer to Obia and Jose. I don't just leave it off. But I'm really interested in identity. Identity, right? yeah. And the processes of identity and what identity is and what it means and uh, racial and religious identities uh, as processes. So I start the chapter out with uh, a quote uh, quotation from uh, Ta Nehisi Coates is Between the World and Me, which I, th I thought not only is it a gorgeous uh, 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 sentence, but it's also I thought, oh, this is exactly what I think, only he said it so much better. Uh, he uh, says, he writes that, quote, race is the child of racism, not the father, end quote. And again, this I, I, it really threw into relief uh, for me uh, underscore the, the problem here is the concept of race first, right? And then that Coates is saying, and then there, but then I go into this whole uh, discussion of, well, but we still need to uh, have race as an identity um, uh, tool because as at least for now, we have no other um, uh, 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 or certainly as effective way to call out racism. Right. And that's the irony, right? That's yeah. the irony is that, you know, in order to call out racism or religious bigotry, for that matter, we have to still have the, you know, I, we, we're not ready. I say in the book, you know, in my perfect world, we jettison all of these uh, identity types because all identities are are types, right, that are created out of certain empowered or disempowered worldviews, right? So yeah. I say my perfect world, which is never going to happen, I, or not in my lifetime, let me be, let me be optimistic, not in my <laughs> lifetime, is to not have this operating at all, these kinds of uh, rhetorical strategies about different kinds of... In which categories. Yes, categories, thank you. But we're not ready to, to, to jettison uh, race and religion as identity categories because they are pa still powerful ways of calling out racism, bigotry, discrimination. Right. But the, but the irony is at the same time, are we reiterating? Are we reinforcing the very um, uh, problematic kinds of uh, effects that they have? Are we wow. basically are we keeping race alive by race? Excuse me, racism alive by keeping race as our a as one of our primary tools to call out racism you know it's that's like a, a such a paradox yeah yes, that yes. is wow so tool? that's that's your identity i guess your 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 initial uh concept of identity where you were saying how it kind of works both ways so that, i guess that's yeah. the same thing exactly that's, that's very interesting that's Am I, Look, i'm giving you a for you because that, that was yes thank you thank you that was great I, yeah. Hallelujah, yeah wow I don't even know how to process that that's so I guess yeah I guess I'm reiterating whatever whatever I'm trying to fight against yes and again that I'm not saying that therefore we're doomed and you know or, or we're ready to get to not use the concept of race or religion I'm, or, or gender 
or sexuality. I'm, you know, we're not, we're not doomed and we're also not ready to, to get rid of them. But I think part of our awareness about how to, when I, I would say wean ourselves off of these concepts is, away from them is to, um, uh, is to, is to say, to, to identify this, this, this contradiction, this, this, this conundrum, this irony. And mm. so to get back to your question, uh, yeah, I would suggest that people read that last chapter. They can fast forward to the last chapter, not just because of what I'm saying, but because I quote some very uh, good, uh, I think, uh, uh, authors uh, uh, in there that they can pursue. You know, Kwame Appiah's work on um, uh, on identity, recent recent book on identity. He's a, a, a philosopher, a fabulous uh, philosopher. And there's also, um, gosh, um, I, uh, and I also uh, talk a little bit about Foucault. Oh, but also um, Asad Haider and his recent book on identity, very, very accessibly written, Kwame Appiah's book, very accessibly written, Foucault, not so much, uh, Judith Butler, not so much. But I think a good starting point would, at least for my, uh, you know, what I think is important to think about identity as a complicated, problematic concept would be to start with the, this chapter and the people that I discuss in it, the scholars, and, uh, and, and again, who write very accessibly in the, at least the stuff I'm quoting and, 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 and engaging with. Because I mean, my premise is identity, you know, what's it good for? Like, remember that, you know, whoa, what is it good for? You know, well, identity, nothing. what is it good for? Yeah, not, well, yeah for? and again, I'm not ready to say nothing, but that's really where I would like to see the world in, in, in the year, you know, 2900 or something, right? Sure. That, that we have forms of communality. Don't get me wrong. I'm not in one, oh, well, all, all men are an island. No, 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 no. That we, we have forms, you know, to end on this. Uh, I, this is an important you know, I think clarification here to, we, that we want forms of commu communality and collectivity as the basis of the way we understand our, uh, our, 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 our kinship, right? And to go back to, you know, indigenous peoples of the Americas, we know, anthropologists know very well, as the indigenous peoples themselves know very well, many of these uh, uh, cultures did not understand identity in individuated terms. I mean, part of what I argue in this last chapter is that the, the, the real crux, the crux of the problem is the individual. And we need to get rid of the whole idea of the individual, right? And that in fact, we have wonderful models from indigenous cultures where they, they, uh, they're, they, uh, their identifications of self and other it's not that they don't think that they, they, they think they just blur into everything. No, the, uh, their identification of self and other is based on much more of the collective, much more of the communal kinds of kinship that they share. And, uh, and you know, I, I don't I'm not an expert uh, on, on indigenous uh, peoples anywhere in the world, even in the Americas. But I, I know enough to know that we already have human uh, 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 capabilities and models. To, to do that. So identity is a problem, but let's start out by asking again, to bring this full circle, asking why. This is perfect. This is great. Yeah. So that was Sorry. I thought it was going to be. It's super. Thank you so much, Austin. You're terrific. You're terrific.